from a programming point of view, like exercise selection with, mm. like you said, seven foot athletes, uh, that yeah. schedule, um, yep. would you, what, what, how did you apply a different program to, I guess, the Australian sort of traditional model in terms of like yeah. maybe box squat in season, trap bar yeah. deadlift, doing more machines or simple movements or is it, yeah, take us through. Sort yeah, of it's tough. And, and the other one is you're often in a hotel gym or you're in, a, in an arena gym and you don't have the equipment. So a lot of stuff's done um, with bands, whether it be mini bands or, or resistance bands, like bigger bands. Um, but typically for the taller guys, um, it, it just depends individually. We would definitely have guys box squatting, but some guys are so tall and just can't coordinate it. It becomes a risk reward thing. And, and the other thing with the NBA is you only have a three week preseason. So, and the turnover is so high. So you might get a kid from Europe that comes in and can barely lift. And so you have, you know, you're not going to teach a guy proficiently to squat or power clean or whatever that exercise is in that period. Something you mentioned earlier is how often uh, jobs are sort of um, uh, successful applicants come through in a networks rather than sort of publicly advertised, like in under, yeah. other industries. Uh, how yes. how common is it for Australians? You mentioned Lock and Penfold that worked at Gold State Warriors yes. for yourself, but how yeah. how many Australian coaches are sort of worked in the NBA over the last sort of decade? Uh, yeah, so it's I think I don't know of anyone that was in. I think I might have been one of the first in there. I started in two thousand and thirteen. Um, and there was, when I started, there was no Australians and then four or five years later, there was a ton, but a lot of them came through, um, the networks of, of the first person over there. So, um, Troy at Milwaukee, they've had a lot of Australians through there. Troy was at the U S ski team. Um, and a lot of his staff have come from the U S ski team. And a lot of the staff that we had at the U S ski team have ended up at different teams. So now, I mean, I don't, I don't keep track of it, but I would say, probably a third of the teams have at least one Australian on staff on the medical and physio or, or strength and conditioning. But it definitely, it definitely wasn't like that when I started, but it, it proliferated, it proliferated very quickly. So in terms of demand on a strength and conditioning coach working in the NBA, so you mentioned mm. something that's sprung out to me in terms of like seven games in 10 yeah. days in six cities. Yeah. There's not a lot of life yeah. outside of basketball. It yeah. sounds like with that, with that going on, it's a real bubble. Uh, yeah. How do you manage your, your workload? And I think the best way to describe the NBA travel schedule, if you're traveling with the team, it just feels like you're jet lagged the whole time. You kind of wake up in a hotel room and it takes you kind of, you know, 30 seconds to calibrate which city you're in and, and, and what's happening that day. Um, at the same time, really, you know, cool opportunities. You get to, you get to travel the U S and, and, you know, meet a lot of people that you ordinarily wouldn't. Um, but the other thing is for us, we would play, we, would, we went to the final for four straight years against Golden State. And then you think you just when you're ready for a break, it doesn't come because the draft is three days later. So all of a sudden you've got to do all these workouts for all the draft kids that are coming in. And then summer league hits you a week later and you've got to go to Vegas for two weeks. And then I worked with one of our players over the summer. So I just traveled wherever he went. So we'd be in LA or we'd be in the Hamptons or, and then, so it is very demanding. And it was tough for me because I had three young kids at the time. Um, yeah, wow. and so it's, it's a very hard thing. And, and part of the reason that, well, the, the, the reason that I left the job in the end is I just couldn't, I couldn't maintain family life and that life. I was, I was just missing too much of, of my family's life. And you need the biggest trait I could say for someone working in the NBA or, or working in a sport that has that demand is you have to have a personality that is durable and it's consistent. You can't you can't be up and down. It just does it just doesn't fly in those. You've got a small and small crew of people, and you need people that emotionally can stay consistent. You know the highs aren't too high and the lows aren't too low. And then you also just have to be durable. You just have to grind your way through it. And it, it, at the same time, I sound like I'm complaining. It's 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 an unreal opportunity. It's an amazing experience. But um, you know, you just you just have to be willing to to make those sacrifices. What did you learn from the world-class athletes that you worked with at the top level in terms of their mindset and, and work rate, work ethic? Yeah, I think, look, I was lucky. We had, we had some unbelievable athletes. I think, I think the biggest, the biggest thing I took away from the really, the great NBA players is they just love the game. They absolutely love basketball and it's crazy. You'll see as much basketball as you play, you'll get on a bus after a game and they'll be watching other games. And they're just so passionate about that particular game. And I think to, to really um, be the difference between the good player and the amazing player is they just, 
they just fall in love with the sport, whatever that sport is. Um, and, and, and that's something I've seen in every sport that I've worked with. And the other thing that I think the really great athletes have to fall in love with training as well, because the reality is to get great, you have to embrace strength training and conditioning training, and you have to be passionate about that. So uh, amongst the really amazing athletes that I've been lucky enough to work with across a range of different sports over the years, I could barely think of any that just don't love training and, and are really consistent with their training, not just their sport, but actual the physical training. What, what do you believe yeah. are very important skills for strength and conditioning coaches or physiotherapists in a rehab role working with long-term uh, injury? Yeah, I think, I think the best piece of advice I ever got was from Bill Knowles, who's an athletic trainer. He does a lot of um, the ACLs, a lot of, um, a lot of the AFL and rugby league players have gone out to see him. And, and he told me, because um, he'd, he'd worked with, with one of the skiers that I worked in the US, he said, the most important thing in rehab is to get them to bed tired. And that resonated with me because too often, you know, someone's, someone comes in and they've hurt themselves. And, and the reality is for a professional athlete, that's, that's, their, that's, that's what their career is. That's what they're passionate about. That's what they want to do. That's where their money comes from. And all of a sudden, that's in jeopardy or that's taken away from them. And it can be a pretty lonely and dark place. Um, even if you're on a team, because it's sometimes in a team, it's even worse because you see everyone doing what you want to do and, and you're not able to do it. 